the ethos I had was the way you prove yourself is by doing the work well. And I wanted to prove that I knew it, that I knew how to do it. Not I am a woman who knows how to do it, it was I. My permanent focus was always not to debate, not to argue, but to show I am capable of doing this job. Greetings. I'm Erica James, Dean at the Wharton School, and I am thrilled to be joined today by Ms. Anita Summers, luminary economist, profound scholar in public policy, and very proudly an emeritus professor from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Anita, thanks so much for being here. And thank you very much. I'm very honored by being here. I want to actually literally start at the very beginning. So you were born in 1925 and grew up during the Great Depression. How did that influence your decision to become an economist? You can see in some ways why it's very hard to fully answer that question since I was such a young child uh, uh, during that time. But what I recall when it first happened, my father was a uh, senior um, uh, a vice president of a major bank in New York City, and we lived, and we were very wealthy and lived in Great Neck in a great big house on great land and all of that kind of thing. And then all I remember, and I was probably, you know, three years old, uh, uh, was my mother crying and everything changing. Mm -hmm. And we moved to New York to a small apartment, uh, you know, but I didn't, I didn't understand what happened, of course, but I, the world fell apart. But in our household, the important thing was education. Mm -hmm. Nothing was stressed more than education. I still remember, and I still have this, I have the full set of the Encyclopedia Britannica, <laughs> if you remember that ancient oh, yes. uh, book. And whenever we would sit at dinner and ha anybody had a question about something, my father would say, why don't we look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica? And then we would be discussing it uh, and so on. So I, and that was there just absolutely permanently as, 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 as uh, part you know, uh, a part of the education. So it got much more emphasis than the change in our economic level. By the end of the 30s, my father came out of the very deep part and we moved to a much bigger apartment and it, things were not with the way they were, but they were fine, absolutely fine. I went to Hunter College because all mm -hmm. my friends were going to Hunter College. At that point, they could have afforded to send me to an outside college, but I wanted to go with my friend. And I had what I regard as the finest education I had in my life. Everybody in the school was a sc scholarly, at least in some way. And the teaching was extraordinary. And th the way I came to economics was that the, uh, they require the first two years of liberal arts education, mm -hmm. two years of, of, the, of the social sciences, two years of the sciences. And, and two years of mathematics, two years of arts, and so mm -hmm. on, required. And only at the end of your sophomore year did you choose your major. Mm -hmm. I took the social sciences, and I took a history course, and I took a sociology course, and then I took an economics course. And then at the same time, in my math requirements, I took calculus, and then I took, you could opt for statistics. And I took them in the same semester. And suddenly, that's the only way I describe it, the whole thing clicked. Uh, and I thought, why are we in the economics courses always discussing, I understood why we were discussing the theory, but we were never verifying mm. in the, the outcomes of it. And then in statistics, I was learning regression analysis and all that, and I didn't understand that. Then they had, uh, in your senior uh, semester, uh, they had seven of us were uh, economics, uh, honors in economics, and you met once a week with a professor. I still remember her name. She was so extraordinary. And that was a few years after uh, John Maynard Keynes' book on general theory was came out. And it, 
and the topic for the semester was the general theory. And each of us were given one topic in there. You had to read the whole book, but one topic in there uh, at, for your study. You had to do penetrating study. You had to go and try and find numbers to show things. And then you had to do presentation. And mine was the employment mu multiplier. That is, if government uh, pr pr gives some money, there's an employment multiplier and how you calculate it and all of that. So that, again, put the, the statistical thing connected with the theory. And that stayed with me. I never uh, thought about a full-time career. And by the way, one small exception, uh, in the literature, I took a course in Shakespeare, and we read The Merchant of Venice. And there was Portia was a, a, a lawyer. And I thought, a woman was a lawyer? And that made me take a course in st uh, constitutional law, uh, which I enjoyed very much. And I thought, gee, I wonder if I could be a lawyer. And I spoke to a professor, and I said, you know, I was thinking maybe I wanted to be a lawyer. This was still in my sophomore year. And she said, you'll get into a decent law school, a good law school, and you'll get a job. And you'll be in the back room. You will never see a courtroom, and you will never see a client. That's what you'll do. That was my first statement of, of, of a woman. So mm -hmm. I just dismissed law. Uh, 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 and, 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 and went with the other, but I had no idea what, what I, I, I was going to do. So that's, that's what the early year. So I, I think that probably in some deep way, my response to the economics course was um, in some ways came from knowing all the economic change in my life in those early years, but it wasn't a conscious uh, decision. A fascinating story, and there are so many different directions that we can go in that. I, I was just ruminating on my own life and career exploration, and I remember being in high school, and the options, particularly for women, and I grew up in the South, so maybe this is more of a Southern thing, but oh. they were teacher, nurse, doctor, lawyer. Like Those are the four professions that were familiar and that one could possibly pursue. And economist was nowhere in there. <laughs> like it just never, it wasn't until I was much older that you realized there was this whole field of economics and that you could get a career in, in doing that work. So it's fascinating that you were so ahead of the game in that regard. So you began working on your doctorate in economics in the late 19... Well, it was my master's degree at masters. that point, yeah. And that was obviously at a time where there were very few women pursuing those degrees and certainly those quantitative degrees like, like economics. What, how did you persevere? What allowed you to be successful in that domain when I'm suspecting there weren't very many people who had preceded you? I only thought about it in terms of the work. Mm -hmm. And the, the, uh, the ethos I had was the way you prove yourself is by doing the work well. And I wanted to prove that I knew it, that I knew how to do it. Mm -hmm. Not I am a woman who knows how to do it. Mm -hmm. It was I. I absolutely d didn't think that way. And when, when I was confronted by, by that, I was startled. And even then, my permanent focus was always not to debate, not to argue, but to show I am capable of doing this job mm -hmm. well. Can you give an example of how you were confronted with being a woman in that field? What that well, first like? of all, when I was at the University of Chicago, th there were very, very few women in, in economics classes. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, there were people like the famous Jack uh, Viner, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who you took a course with, who was terrified of everybody. And there was just me and another woman in the class. There were about 20 in the class. And he treated us two differently than he did the other. His style was to come in, the, in, the, the black, come in right on the blackboard a set of equations and things and say, uh, you go up and describe it. But when it was the two, either she or I, he would point like this and say, you, go and explain it mm. with a sharp, 
tongue, and I would go nervous. I was a nervous wreck, <laughs> terrified. I was not going to know what I was doing, you know. And so he terrified us both. The other woman twice broke into tears uh, uh, after that, that. So that was the only. That was the only difference. Apart from that. Uh, I, I did not find that in, in the in in the education. So I'm I'm curious. Over the next several years, uh, you went on to have a successful family life while also pursuing your work. And can you tell us a little bit for the young people who are watching this and sort of thinking about having to navigate work family issues? How did you? How did I make How that transition? How did you make that transition? Yeah. Well, first of all, when I got married, and uh, I I worked, um, uh, I I continued working at Standard Oil mm -hmm. uh, until uh, uh, they, they 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 their order was that if a woman became pregnant, she had to notify them immediately. Any any female, mm -hmm. but there were. I was the only female economist, uh, and uh, then if you're pregnant, you were not allowed to work after three months. But I, I was my by then my husband was teaching at Yale. We were living in New Haven, and I commuted every day to Thirty Rockefeller Plaza. And I said, I'm perfectly capable for another three, you know, six months to do six months, you know, and so mm -hmm. on. And so they had never had the request before. And they finally said, well, if your doctor is ready to, to give an, a notarized document that he will take full uh, responsibility, responsibility. <laughs> and so on, which he did. And so I commuted and, and did the work until I was uh, 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 six months. And that, then that was it. But uh, after that, uh, for when my, my children are just roughly two years apart, so you know I was involved, and then I became when they began to be in kindergarten, and you know we were away in school uh, somewhat. I uh, joined the League of Women Voters, and by then we moved to here. My husband, you know, was an economist here at the university, uh, and uh, I joined the League of Women Voters, and I became president of the, the League of Women Voters of Lower Marion. In some discussion, we came. We were talking about real estate taxation among us uh, and the tax rate. We discovered that if you bought a, your house ten or fifteen years ago, the tax rate, current tax rate, was applied to the value of the house fifteen years ago, mm -hmm. even though the value may have gone up fifty percent. Mm -hmm. And that clearly was unfair, because the value, the tax rate, is supposed to put on the value of the house. So. I and another person spent uh, several months gathering data, which we uh, from Montgomery County. That was the unit, and gathering data on the value of the house, the current value of the house, and the tax rates, and so on. And we put together a paper recommending that e equality called for, for for that, and that got in the newspapers. And uh, of course, the, the tax people didn't like that very much. Then the Lower Marion uh, had a town meeting every, I don't remember how often, and they asked me to give a talk on it to the town meeting. Mm -hmm. And there were about 60, 70 people there. And when we gathered for it, the man who was going to introduce me sat here, and I sat here, and then the audience was there. And while we were waiting for, for people to gather, somebody in the front row, a man, of course, said, why don't you go back and do your knitting? Just like that. Wow. And that was my first direct statement, and I reacted the way I always did. I, I just nodded and didn't ignore it, and I didn't refer to it, and I didn't get angry. Again, my inner feeling was, let me just speak and give the evidence and, mm -hmm. and do it that way. And that that was the best answer. I, it was more, I always took this as more demeaning of me and my mind rather than me as a female. Mm. But I realized that that's uh, always, uh, you, know, you know, what I did. And uh, I would not do any other way in, in my mind. I loved taking care of my youngsters. Mm -hmm. I believe parenting, the parents are the best caretakers. That doesn't mean that there aren't ways of balancing things, but uh, that was a joy to me. 
Did you work full time while you were also caring for your children? No. Uh, when my children were uh, all in school, you know, someone, uh, out of the blue, somebody gave, uh, somebody at Swarthmore College in the economics department had passed away. It was in the spring. And they needed somebody in the fall to cover Economics 101. Mm -hmm. And somebody gave them my name and, and so on. And uh, Larry Klein, actually. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, and they called and asked if I would be willing to teach a, a course in the fall. And I had been out for 11 years, okay? And I said, I can only do it before 3 o'clock, and I have to be home, you know, and so on. And my husband immediately said, and I'll put my class, uh, have my classes on the days you don't, so if any of our children get sick, one of us will be there. Right. And Im immediately, uh, and so on. So that summer, I kind of brought myself up after 10 years away, back into shape. Mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then I taught there for, then I began to teach urban public finance and, and urban economic, uh, urban economic things, and then published uh, some things. And then that's how the Federal Reserve came. Right. And, um, and the Federal Reserve called and asked if I would head there in their research department, the um, the urban work, mm -hmm. and I said, yes, but I can only work four days a week, mm -hmm. and I have to leave at four o'clock. Mm -hmm. Well, they never had anybody ever ask that. <laughs> See, this is my point. I, I didn't argue. I didn't fight this kind of thing. I just, I wasn't going to do it if I couldn't be home, and so on. And so HR there went into to discussion, and they came back, and they said they'd pay me an hourly wage and no benefits. Uh, and so on, uh, and the hour, I said fine, that was no problem, and and I worked, and of course you know, understand, I ended up working at home to finish articles and and so on, and that's when a lot of publications uh, poured out. Hearing your story, it's just so much of a reminder that we choose our own path, and while there might be predetermined pathways for people to be successful in their careers or in their per personal lives. If that's not going to work for you, make your own path and make that's, let people know what you need to be and successful that's, and productive. That was my first comp time when I was like fully aware of this whole issue of, of women. Uh, when the head of the department uh, called to offer the job and told me the salary, and he said we decided we could get the same brains for less money. And this is with Standard Oil. This is Standard Oil and the head now, of the department, who turned out to be the most wonderful mentor and every, everything in the world. But, and I was startled, and I thought, I don't care. I don't care. So it was a good, a good, a good job and, and going to be very challenging. The big th issue came after I was there about two years. Uh, Emilio Collado, who had been the American representative to the World Bank and so on, you know, and was the CFO of all of Standard Oil, you know, they had a decision to make about buying a piece of land in South Africa where they wanted to build a refinery. Mm -hmm. And th they had a reason for that location. The question was, those were the years when the so-called dollar shortage ex existed. You could, uh, if, if you made profits in a foreign country, you could use the, uh, the money there, but you had trouble getting it back to the United States. Mm -hmm. The question was, five years from now, will we be able to get this back? Mm the dollars back. And the question came up on Friday, and the decision had to be made by Wednesday. So I, I had a research assistant, and I worked, you can't, 15 hours a day all, all weekend, uh, and I gathered all kinds of data, again, um, data, uh, data to, to do this. And then I wrote the report on Monday, and my immediate boss read, read it and did a little editing, and then the head of the department read it. And then on Tuesday morning, when it was to be discussed with Collado, my immediate boss said, Anita, I don't know how to tell you this, but Collado will not have a woman in his office except secretary. I said, what? He said, so I'm going down, so please stay next to the phone. And all morning, every 10 minutes, the phone would ring, he would ask the question, I would answer it, <laughs> and so on. But again, I, what I was furious of was I did all that work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I put in incredible. I hardly slept. And 
the idiocy of having somebody else, I felt my brain was being insulted. Mm -hmm. So when they came back at lunchtime, I said, um, of course I'm going to see this through. No, no arguments on that, nothing to debate on that. But uh, there, we have three options ahead. I said, either you and Ned, the head of the department, have the courage to take me down this afternoon. Secondly, alternative is I never get a job from him again. I do other jobs, mm -hmm. but I don't do this. And third, you can fire me if you don't like it, and so on. But I will never do this again. So they huddled, and then they took me down. And we went down to the office, and Cogliato looked at me and said, what's she doing there? And then Ned said, well, she wrote the pay did the work. So then he began by asking the others, but then I answered, and that was the end of the problem. <laughs> and, and so that was the most unbelievable one from a person who's supposed to be highly intelligent, uh, that uh, because I was a woman, right. I couldn't come in and talk about all the work I had done in, in detail. And so, but anyway, it was never a problem again after that. So I, I actually want to pick up on that because thinking about the longevity that you've had in this field and doing this work, how have you seen things change and shift in terms of the receptivity and the, the, um, the diversity of people going into the yeah. economics field? Have you noticed changes? Yeah, I, I, on the whole, I have not had much um, of the, uh, negative ex experience in that. Mm -hmm. But when I was at the Fed, for example, uh, one of the first things I did after I was there a year or two was this, the city was having significant, Lennox Moat was the CFO of the city, and they were having significant budgetary issues. Mm -hmm. And so I, with two other people in my section, did extensive work on the budgets, mm -hmm. examined the pension funds, examined uh, the efficiency studies in, in, on, on a lot of this, the services and or, 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 every detail of it. And then a whole issue of the Federal Reserve Bulletin was an analysis, very polite, by the way, nev not accusing anybody of doing wrong, but just saying, what are the problems and here are possible solutions. That's the way it was framed. But it was very detailed on every facet of the budget. Mm -hmm. So it got front headlines in, in, in the... Uh, Philadelphia papers and, mm -hmm. and, and so on. And then uh, I got a million invitations to speak. And the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the Philadelphia Chamber, invited me to speak, and Lennox Moak was going to be speaking. And there must have been 150 people there. And uh, I have to describe, we, I was, uh, there was a lectern and then a sit, sit. And I was the first person on the lectern, and I went through the issues and the way uh, out. Then when I sat down, Lennox Moat got up, and he turned to me and looked down, and he said, now, little lady, just like that in front of 150 people. And inside, I, <laughs> I flinched, I, but it made the immediate decision that, because I was getting a chance to reply, I would totally ignore it mm -hmm. and go back to, to doing what we were here for. We were not here to argue feminist issues. Mm -hmm. We were here to discuss the budget. So I went back and replied to his fiscal statements. And a lot, a number of people came back and said, good for you, <laughs> uh, and so on. But that's been my path, and I can't fully explain why I am that, in, in, that way. But that's the way, um, you know, I, I, I handle that. You, well, two things that I am taking away from our conversation. One is that you have incredible restraint. And you recognize when challenges are happening to you in the moment, but you consciously make a choice to focus on the work at hand. And, and part of that, I, the psychologist in me is coming out, part of that I interpret as being, you know, your, your, your um, sensitivity to being seen as an intellectual contributor. My emphasis was on, I can do this. Mm. Don't insult me by saying I can't, mm -hmm. rather than don't insult me because I'm a woman. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it, that's, that's what angered me, and that's why I always felt that the response was to show I know what I'm talking about. Right. Yeah. 
So in the introduction, I described that you were also an emeritus professor from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. And I want to get to that point of how you became on faculty here. And so I know that you had been oh. work, working at the Philadelphia Federal Reserve and that you got a call from Wharton Dean Donald Carroll at the time. Tell us about that call. What was it that he was proposing you to do? One day I, at the Fed, I got a call from my uh, secretary called and said, uh, uh, Dean Do uh, Donald Carroll wants to speak. I had never met him, you know, and so my husband was teaching here, for, but you know, he was uh, in the economics department, not in the Wharton School, and so on. I said, all right, uh, uh, and so on. And he said, I would like to start a public policy program in the Wharton School, and I wondered if you'd consider coming to chair it, and so on. I said, a public policy program in a business school? He said, yes, and he remembered these words exactly. Everybody going in the public sector should understand the private sector. Mm -hmm. Everybody going in the private sector should understand the public sector. I said, is there another business school in the country that has a, a policy? He said, no, we'll be the first. So I, I, you know, I said, well, I obviously have to think about this. And I thought, that is an extraordinary dean who had the courage, who th first of all thought that way, right. which of course is exactly the way one should be thinking. Uh, uh, and today we should be thinking about it even more deeply. Uh, and secondly, uh, I, I, I just uh, thought that would be a really exciting thing to, to be doing and so on, and of course discussed it with my husband and, and so on, and then called and said yes, you know, and so on. So I, I, as I said, I didn't have any official, it, it was called program director, mm -hmm. uh, public policy and management. And th that summer I worked, because I had no, nowhere to go to develop a curriculum for a public policy program in a business school, because mm. it's clear that many parts, of course, overlap, but that you had to have an orientation. Mm. I developed the course by reviewing the economics underlying it, the political science underlying it, the impossibility theorem, and then I went into evidence-based, how we analyze what the effects of these things are. So the course consisted of the two sets of theories mm -hmm. and the techniques of evidence-based and cost-benefit analysis. Within three years, I believe, we became a department, and we, I, I was, within four years, I remember having three classes on the basic course with 65 to 70 students in it. They came from all over. And they, they were not people who were gonna go in necessarily the public sector, but they understood it. And one of the great joys of my life is that there's, you know, I'm not gonna say who, half dozen or so very distinguished people who you, you know, mm -hmm. who took that course, that isn't, wasn't their major, mm -hmm. who took the course and have been in contact with me through the years and said it influenced the way they thought, uh, and, and so on. And um, so, and the other part, which is very relevant to today, is I always said, all of this is analytic part. In the end, there are moral values mm -hmm. that come to play. That is not the topic that we do in, in, in this course. We're here as scientists uh, uh, and, and, and so on. And a number of times, not you know, half a dozen times, at the end of the last class, somebody would come up to me and say, Professor Summers, you know, we haven't been able to figure out whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. <laughs> And I thought, good, that, I've done that's my exactly job. <laughs> what I wanted. Because the point was, I was there to teach the analytic tools, what the thought processes, what the techniques are for thinking it through. Mm -hmm. In the end, you may say this or that. And nowadays, with polarization, mm -hmm. I think this exemplifies what polarization is. We have people who are doing the this and that more than they are the basic, Using the, the, the basic facts. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in one of your earlier remarks about educational efficiency. And I know that's something that you're very proud of, the work that you've done in I, that regard. Tell us, tell us more about what 
what educational efficiency is and what, what you've done in that field. When I was at the Federal Reserve and I did this uh, study of the budget, uh, I saw that they had done studies on efficiency of libraries, transportation, um, uh, uh, real estate, you know, certain real estate things. But education was the biggest contributor to the deficit of the major cities in the country, mm. and particularly, and very much so. That's where the biggest city deficit, talk about city deficit. And I thought, why are we not doing a study on the efficiency of city, of education? So I looked into the literature on that, and William Coleman at the University of Chicago was the only person who had done a study using schools as the unit. But schools as a unit, you might have a school with an average score of uh, 50, uh, where uh, it was uh, 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 20 and 80 uh, was, mm -hmm. were scores, or they could have been... 45 and 55, mm -hmm. you see. So I went to the student level in, in Philadelphia. Uh, David Eastburn was uh, pr president of the Fed, the Fed here. And, you know, at first people say, what are we doing doing anything on education? And I said, this translates into finance uh, in, in the end. And, uh, uh, and I show, you know, showed how it did. And so I did this study with several thousand students, and we got background information. So... Uh, controlling for uh, the uh, education of the parents. The, we, we got data on, you know, whether they were immigrants, mm -hmm. uh, whether they were uh, low income, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, all, all of these things. And then looking at teachers and that for teacher quality, we, we had the scores on the national teacher exam, uh, the college they went to, and the, their, the number of their absences uh, and so we got measures of, of them. Anyway, found, as you might expect, and we are now fully back there, uh, that uh, the, the most disadvantaged students had the teachers who had the lowest grade on the national teacher's exam, mm. the most absences, uh, and, the, you know, and the poorest res results, et cetera. And I was horrified. And the, uh, the, the salaries in teachers only come... Everybody gets a, a, sal a certain percentage salary increase every. And I came out advocating that, like the rest of the world, outstanding teachers should be rewarded and very poor teachers should be let go. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you can imagine the way the unions uh, felt about it. And the union invited me to give a talk, uh, and they were furious. And I spoke to 300 very angry people and so on. But... I just said, outstanding people deserve reward. People who we can demonstrate, mm -hmm. that was the point. We can show mm -hmm. that they were unsuccessful and that there were people who, who were, uh, if you want efficiency, that's what you have to have, and, and so on. So that's how I came in to education. Then the New York State Legislature invited me to come up, their, their subcommittee on education, to talk about uh, the findings on this, in this study. And the uh, head of the National Association of Teachers mm -hmm. uh, and so on was there too. And at, after the meeting was over, he came up to me and he said, Anita, you're absolutely right and it will never happen. And he was right. Uh, so uh, that, anyway, I came into education from a, a financial point. Of view. That's what I'm saying. So as we bring this to a close, Imagine that you are at the chalkboard, or white at the, board, at the whiteboard, or blackboard, oh, or oh, chalkboard, oh, whatever oh. we call it these days, and uh, you are reflecting on your career. What three words would you write that best capture what you've learned over the course of your incredible career? My first, absolutely first thing to say would be focus apart from the, the substance of the work you're doing, on integrity. Remembering all of the participants who are affected by what you're thinking of, whether it's a private sector or public sector, uh, maintaining the standards of integrity. Mm -hmm. And I feel uh, 
uh, people have to learn to submerge their self-interest when they're talking about uh, pu public policy issues. Mm. Uh, uh, the so-called think tanks, what have we got, a thousand of them in the country, there are really five. The others are, uh, are, are lobbyists. They call themselves think tanks, but they are, they are only examining what the, the, the person making the contract wants to have as the answer, and they're asked to prove it. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about absolute think tanks. Mm -hmm. And Mathematica is an example. For example, no one of their employees may be active in a political party. They can be a member of the party. They may not make large contributions, and they may not be identified mm -hmm. in any way. All their, contracts, uh, all their contracts with the federal government that they do on analyzing policies, there's a stipulation that if the government, that, uh, uh, the department that ordered the, the thing doesn't come out with the findings, within three, four months, Mathematica will. Mm -hmm. I'm just giving you illustrations mm -hmm. of integrity. Mm -hmm. And they have maintained it. Very, very few have. Secondly, I think everywhere we go in, pub in policy, public policy, we should be the words evidence-based are being used, and but we should be understanding evidence-based, and the answer has to be evidence, mm -hmm. not your values. Mm -hmm. And I think the integrity and evidence-based go hand in hand. And, uh, and so the, the third thing I would say today in terms of business schools and so on, is that we are now having, for the first time that I remember, discussions of what corporate social responsibility should be. We know that 185 or so signed that whole contract about a year or so ago, mm -hmm. but we don't know whether or not, in fact, in the boardrooms, the discussions are not just what the investors are going to get by way of return, but whether what employees and uh, and uh, a very uh, and, and the community uh, mm -hmm. ha, uh, is going to do, that remains to be seen, and it's a balance because, of course, there's strong merit in focusing on the profits, mm -hmm. but at the same time, how do we incorporate the benefits of social responsibility to it? Now, I I do know that in one of the major Wall Street firms for example, they uh, a few years ago began to be interested in climate changes as a big uh, beneficial issue to society and began to think about investing in it and then decided they would invest uh, in all these new firms coming up, developing new, new, uh, new gadgets right. and, mm -hmm. and all of that. And it turns out they're making a fortune from it because it's a growth industry. Mm -hmm. Now, not everything may work that way, but it's an illustration where they were attracted to it first, as I understand it, by the demands of, of all of the new techniques of, of con uh, climate control, uh, and it turned out to be very beneficial. Obviously, some of them won't. Mm -hmm. But to have those social things on the agenda uh, and then think through and the other last comment I would make there is I think that uh, those going into social work activity mm -hmm. of various kinds should be equally looking at what business school te financial techniques uh, uh, you know, or uh, you know, all kinds of business managerial techniques to bring those more to government. Mm -hmm. That government can clearly learn a great deal from private sector. I think there's mutual examination ahead both ways. Well, Anita Summers, it has been my sheer delight to sit down with you and have this conversation. I learned a lot. I know our viewers will absolutely learn a lot. And we are grateful 
to claim you. We are grateful for the contributions you have made over the years to the Wharton School and to broader society through your intellectual prowess in economics and public policy. Thank you. Thank you for not saying you're congratulating me on my being a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I, it was my honor to be here. <laughs>